everyone, welcome back to our Civ 6 series as Nader Shah. And today we're finally going to speak about who else? Nader Shah. <laughs> it's been a long time coming, but yeah, I'm excited. Let's yeah. do it. In terms of gameplay, I have a few goals that involves getting some promotions on Pingala, getting trade routes to other civs, things like that, which I'll try to explain as we go along. And I think in today's episode, we'll have an idea of when I'm going to win this game. So let's get started. Okay, sounds good. So in the loading screen, which I'll put an image of here, it talks about bondage to king. What is that? reference to. Right. So Nader Shah, very inspiring story. Started from the bottom and now, <laughs> now, he's, in, now, now, he's, here. now he's in Civ 6. He actually did start from very, very humble beginnings, right? He started, he was born into a nomadic tribe of Turkmen, so known as the Afshar. When he was a child, he was taken captive by a, a group of raiding Uzbeks. They took him, they took his mother. His mother died in captivity. But he escaped, and at the age of 15, he enlisted just as a regular soldier, a musketeer, in the army of the local governor, the governor of Mashhad. You know, so his life is really just rising through the ranks, cultivating power. He was beloved by his troops. And when there's a war between the Afghans and the resistant Safavid Shah, Tahmas II, Tahmas II makes him the general. And here's a name to keep in mind. Tahmas II already has a general. Fatali Khan Qajar, and he executes them. He says, Nader, you're in charge now. <laughs> <laughs> so the Qajars keep this name in mind. They will not be happy with this, and they will take some revenge later on. Later on. Later on. For the next episode. <laughs> we get a great writer here, Ooh, nice. Levi Great, Levi. which also reminds me I should purchase all the great works of writing mm. so I can get all of that tourism for myself. Nice. I guess I'm going to need to buy my amphitheater here so I have room in Mashhad where Pingala is. So it looks like the next great writer is going to be Rumi. It doesn't look like I am getting it, but I'm going to make all my efforts <laughs> to get it. It may okay. seem like a way to most people out there, but I really want to get it for this mm -hmm. gameplay. Mm -hmm. So for a while, Tahmasp is the figurehead, Nader Shah is the real power, but then Nader Shah is out in the east combating some rebellions, and Tahmasp is like, okay, now it's my time to shine. He declares war on the Ottomans and is just defeated horribly. <laughs> <laughs> so Nader Shah is like, what the hell did you do? <laughs> Uh, deposes Tahmas, and after that point is essentially running Iran. Do you think he deserved it? <laughs> yeah, he deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> but Nader Shah, you know, sometimes he's called the Napoleon of mm -hmm. Iran. It should be Napoleon is the Nader Shah French of Nader Shah, yeah. Because, you know, Napoleon actually references Nader Shah's victories in his battle tactics. And of course, Nader Shah precedes Napoleon. Yeah, which is, you know, a key part of how these phrases are made, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Nader Shah is actually Turkmen, right? His mother tongue and the language he preferred to speak was not Persian. That's true, yeah. So he is Turkmen. No, Turkmen is not like Frenchmen, Englishmen, right? It, Turkmen is a separate identity from Turk, right? And so he actually really preferred to converse in Turkish, mm -hmm. which is interesting because in the game he speaks in Persian. Obviously, Nader Shah would be All bilingual. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, yes. Wow. Finally. So this is exciting, but I will say I'm kind of mad at us for being in Spain, being in Granada, literally like hours away from yeah, Sevilla. Yeah and not going to see this wonder because I thought it was in Portugal. Yeah, we definitely thought it was in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> but it is not, it is in Sevilla. So that means I get a bunch of governor promotions so I can finally get curator, which nice. is awesome. And I'm gonna be promoting Reina and Moksha to other cities. So what's very interesting about Nader Shah, he almost is like a like a pan-Turkist before pan-Turkism became an ideology. You know, he was always saying like, Oh, I have my solidarity with the Mughals because we're descended from the same people. Mm -hmm. I have solidarity with the Ottomans because we're both Turkic people. He did not know like the older Central Asian form of Turkish, Chaatai, but again, he did speak Oz Turkic. I will say, the Turkic that he spoke heavily Persianized. Yes. <laughs> so there'll be a grammar that is Turkish, but the words themselves will be Persian. And actually, there's an inscription about Nader Shah in his. Um, like side city? <laughs> side chick city? Side chick, <laughs> side chick city, Kal Kalat. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the inscription, I was reading it and it's like pretty heavily Persianized Turkish, but it is still Turkish, right? And that is his preferred language. Yeah, yeah. So even when he was talking with the Mughal emperor, I mean, the Mughals are 
absolutely fluent in Persian, but he preferred to speak with them in Turkish because, again, probably a flex, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was reading an article that said their Turkish would have been very different. It would have been way more convenient for them to just speak Persian with yeah, each other. Yeah. Which is really funny. Yeah, actually it's kind of funny because Reza Shah and Atatürk also spoke Turkish together, even though they probably would have been more comfortable in French. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and don't forget, we're going after Plymouth here. So in 1736, Nader declares himself Shah. And it's very funny how he does this. He decides he wants to, again, recreate that kind of Timurid thing, that Mongol thing. So he calls what's called a kudultai. We had a big gathering of all these nobles, nomadic leaders, and he puts it to a vote, says, okay, you can either vote for the Safavids to be Shah, or you can vote for me. And one guy's like, well, I'm voting for the Safavids. Nader's like, okay, arrest that guy, strangle him. Oh no. <laughs> and then let's have the vote. So obviously he wins the vote, comes the Shah. Very interesting Shah, because he's not trying to continue the Safavids, actually. He's actually trying to do something pretty new. He's trying to sort of dampen the religious aspect of the state a little bit, kind of dampen Sunni Shia sectarianism, and to make the state a little bit more of a kind of martial state, right? Army with a state, basically. Mm -hmm. Which is probably one of the reasons why I wasn't expecting Nader Shah as a leader. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad he's here because this time period is very much understudied mm -hmm. because a lot of people just go from the Safavids to the Rajars. And this time period has been sort of called the tribal interlude between two <laughs> empires. Yeah. But of course, that's not the whole story. There's a lot of architectural and artistic patronage that we're going to talk about in this episode that Definitely. are really important. And I think, you know, having Nader Shah as a leader gives us the opportunity to talk about it, but also gives people the opportunity to learn about it. For sure, definitely. I mean, I remember I was reading a text that said, the less we talk about 18th century Iran, the better. <laughs> I'm not going to dwell on it. It was horrible. And it's just not the case. Obviously, it was a very violent period, but at the same time, you have such amazing works of patronage. You have the Zan dynasty, which we'll talk about. Very underrated dynasty. Mm -hmm. I'm buying an art museum. Nice. Speaking of art. And a lot of the art is actually inspired by the invasions of India, of the Mughal Empire. And mm -hmm. you see a lot of commonalities and inspiration taken from Mughal art. Definitely, yeah. So Nader is very famous for his invasion of India, invasion of Delhi. He kind of does it on a pretext, but is mostly just there to loot. Mm -hmm. And he loots. <laughs> he loots he a does. lot. <laughs> Ooh, this would be nice, I think. Ooh, yeah. Oh, but I just sold every... <laughs> Diplomatic favor. <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> Let's see if I can still win it. Let's see, let's see. Oh, oh we get Kilwa. Nice. Excellent. Now, Kilwa is in Zanzibar, and I so badly want to go to Zanzibar. But it's like a 20 hour layover in Qatar, and I was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, no Zanzibar for us this year, mm -hmm. but, and it's very expensive. Yeah. We'll Past. Oh, nice. Okay, a lot happened. A lot happened this turn. <laughs> Okay, continue. So Nader Shah invades Delhi. The Mughals at this point are pretty weak, so he very easily conquers the city. They seize huge amounts of Mughal diamonds, jewels, artwork. Mm -hmm. They take it back to Mashhad and to Nader's side city, <laughs> Kalat. <laughs> Which maybe we should rename this city, right? Let's rename some cities, yeah. Yeah, okay, here is his side chick city, Kalat. He takes, in particular, two very, very famous things. The Peacock Throne, which is this immense jeweled throne that is just incredible. I mean, you can see it in these images here. But he carts that all the way to Mashhad. But today we don't know where it is. It got lost, yeah. Yes. I don't know how you lose that, but <laughs> it got lost. It's like in some guy's house <laughs> yeah. out in Kalat. In his basement, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that we have Kilwa, we want to make sure we have two suzerainties of each type of city-state. Okay. So I believe first we should work on maybe we want faith first because we're going to be buying a lot of naturalists soon. And then next we'll work on Bandar Brunei. Next we'll work on Bandar Brunei. <laughs> All right, sounds good. So the other very famous thing that Nader steals is the 
Kuhinor mm -hmm. Diamond. He actually names it this, Mountain of Light. This was a diamond that is was huge, it was enormous. So he takes it, again, back to Mashad, he's wearing it all the time. But then what happens is, you know, basically Nader's descendants hold on to this diamond. Then it gets passed to the King of Afghanistan. Then it gets passed to the King of the Sikh Empire. And then Queen Victoria, in a treaty, forcibly takes it. It is still part of the British crown jewels. Yeah, let's see if she's wearing it. It's red here, but I think when you look at the picture of Victoria, the painting of her, I think that's yeah. supposed to be. Her brooch. And then what do the British do? They cut the diamond down by like half. <laughs> so it's like much tinier now. Apparently when they showed it to the, the Sikh ruler who had previously had it, he was not very happy. Do the British, is that a rupture in tradition or are they actually continuing that tradition of yeah. Nader stealing it? Yeah. <laughs> which, speaking of which, should I, should I sell it to the Ottomans or to the British? Mm. Well, Nader sends a lot of stuff to the Ottomans, right? Yeah. From his plundering. So I think we're going to change history a little. Okay, Give it right, to the nice, Ottomans. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of Nader's main diplomatic goals was to kind of establish a peace with the Ottomans. It didn't really work. I mean, they had treaties at, at certain times, but they kept fighting and fighting. So we won the mil. I forgot there was a military emergency. I guess I should have waited for peace with Victoria until now. Nader also makes some changes to the empire. He puts in a census. He puts in fixed salaries for soldiers. And he really tries to kind of dampen the power of the Shi ulama and of the kind of local leaders, right? Mm -hmm. Who had previously kind of caused problems for the Safavids. Okay, I need to make sure I get all my trade routes out, mm -hmm. um, especially in cities I'm building wonders in. So in Kalat and Naderi, we also have some interesting architecture. Yeah, we really see the Mughal influence, I think. So in Kalat, there's this, you know, kind of tower. It's unfinished. Mm. called Basre Khorshid, which means uh, Sun Palace. Sun Palace, thank you. It was built by Nader and it has a lot of interesting Mughal influences, right? Yeah, it has these kind of shallow reliefs that are uh, floral motifs, vegetal patterns, tropical fruits, so he's borrowing that from the Mughal style. And it has this fluted column on top, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of like the Seljuk Towers, actually. Yeah, I think there's a reference made to Seljuk Towers there, but also to the minaret in mm. India. That's true, yeah. In Delhi, you have like these very fluted minarets. Yeah. I think he's really borrowing from that because that building was actually meant to house the stuff that he took from India. And, you know, he actually took so much stuff from India that he canceled taxes for three years. Wow. Yeah. The Sun Palace is also kind of a Ashbehesht, right? It is a yeah. pavilion. Yeah, so we spoke last time about the Hashbehesh. Can you explain what that means while I figure out what I'm doing in the game? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so Hashbehesh means eight paradises. It is a kind of structural form involving eight chambers or mm -hmm. nine chambers, which is central chamber sometimes. Exactly. So it's nine chambers, but it's one central one and the eight paradises surrounding, surrounding it. Surrounding it. The Sun Palace is an octagon, so it's also building on that eight symbolism. And this palace type is really popular in Mughal India. A lot of the tombs of the Mughal emperors are in that style. Yeah, I think Taj Mahal is actually maybe a Hashbahesh. I yeah. think so. We'll, we'll check that. We'll get our fact checkers on that. Yeah. <laughs> We get mercantilism, excellent. So with mercantilism, I believe, we can check out what monopolies we have. Mm. Yes. So we want to make sure we get all these monopolies. Cotton, coffee, dyes, fur, jade. Definitely that diamond monopoly is on point, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, should we finally give her some diamonds? All right, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. You're welcome, Victoria. <laughs> Although actually now the governments of India and Pakistan both want the diamond back. Yeah, give it back. Please give it back. It talks in the Civilopedia about how Nader tried to make Iran a bit more religiously tolerant. Iran became multi-religious and more tolerant. It was a selling point to the Sunni Ottomans with whom after they fought a stalemate, Nader sought closer ties. I mean, it seems like it was much more of a political decision, partly to keep the army together. I mean, it was multi-confessional, but also because, yeah, he, his main aim was to settle the question of the Western frontier. To do that, he needed the Ottomans to accept him as the Shah of Iran to kind of settle the border. So there's many, many rounds of treaty discussions Discussion. He wants to, for example, instead of having a kind of Shia Islam and a Sunni Islam, to say that there are just five schools of Islamic law 
and that Shia Islam is one of the schools. Actually, he convenes a conference of all these ulama, imams, all these people, and they actually agree. They agree to make the Jafari mezhab, the Shia mezhab, as part of the schools of Islamic law, but the Ottomans don't really recognize it. <laughs> so he keeps trying this, and eventually, as his position gets weaker and weaker and weaker, he has to settle for less and less and less, so by the end, he's not actually getting any of this. But keep in mind, Nader does continue the patronage of Shia pilgrims. He covers the tomb of Ali in gold. Mm -hmm. Again, more gold. Yeah, in Najaf. <laughs> in Najaf. Okay, so we get the Potato Palace. I don't think it's called Potato Palace. I don't think it's called Potato Palace. But everyone calls it Potato Palace. It's Potala Palace. Potala Palace. <laughs> Not the Potato McWhiskey Palace. The Potato McWhiskey Palace. <laughs> <laughs> they should rename it. Yeah. Okay, and I'm gonna chop it out in Korla. Oh, that was in the wrong city. Arr. Oh, I didn't get a... We didn't get Rumi? I didn't get Rumi. No, he's got Chaucer. Ugh. That sucks. <laughs> Freaking Chaucer. Who needs that? <laughs> no offense, Chaucer fans, I no, guess. No, Chaucer stands. <laughs> so a lot of the visual references we have for Nader actually come from the Mughals. Right? Because mm -hmm. even though he did destroy Delhi, mm -hmm. he actually did not want to deal with India very much. So he put the Mughal Emperor Muhammad Shah back on the throne, said, okay, you'll be my vassal. And the later Mughal Emperors continue as Nader's vassals. Yeah, and we have this excellent image mm -hmm. showing that. Um, it's really beautiful. Yeah, so, you know, because of that, we have a lot of depictions of him from the Mughals. You know, the Mughals intermarried with his children, so there was a pretty close connection with India. And that's actually why we put India in this game. Yeah, and I think one thing we were discussing in sort of preparing for this episode is, you know, how is Nader Shah different from the British in mm. this case. You know, the British also plunder India, steal a lot of their stuff too. But I think the main difference comes from this idea of colonialism versus conquest, right? Right, I mean, Nader was part of this very long tradition, including the Mughals themselves, of people who came from Afghanistan, Central Asia, moved down into Northern India, and, you know, established themselves as rulers or plundered, this kind of stuff. Whereas colonialism really was was a, a very drastic rupture. To give an example, I mean, even though Nader liked to speak in Turkish, he was still obviously part of that Persian world, right? Whereas, you know, after a certain period, the East India Company begins as part of that Persian world. They have Persian as their official language, but after a while, they switch to Hindi and English, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, over time, really try their best to cut off India from that Persian world. You have the huge disruptions, you have the famines, you have all this, you know, massacres that happen under British rule. Okay. We're talking about two empires. Empires are never gentle things, right? In the Civilopedia entry, they talk about Nader building towers of skulls. He did that. So did the Ottomans. There's a very famous skull tower in Serbia that they built. It's just like visceral, spectacular imperial violence. The British did not build towers of skulls, but they did instigate famines that killed millions of people. Right, so it's a different kind of violence, right? It's a biopolitical violence, not a spectacular violence. Right. So what happens in Nader Shah? Eventually, the Qajars, who again are a Turkish tribe, but they're centered in Azerbaijan. Qajar officers in Nader Shah's employ decide to take revenge. Finally, they assassinate him. Mm -hmm. 1747. So Nader Shah, you know, he has his son and grandson, but the dynasty of Nader Shah pretty quickly collapses. And finally, we get the Forbidden City. Ooh, nice. There we go. I really love building building Forbidden City in most of my games, but especially in culture games, because mm -hmm. now we get an extra policy card. Oh, I think I want the gold and the faith. Ooh, that's pretty nice. I think I want to settle one more city around here to get closer to India, maybe mm -hmm. get the dyes online. Watch out, India. <laughs> <laughs> So let's buy one settler out of here. I don't care about the population in the city. And I need to make sure I'm filling out my trade routes. So I'm mm. gonna do a round of trade route buying now. That's a good idea. But first I wanna make sure I'm trading with England. Would you like a trade agreement with England? <laughs> <laughs> I have a trade route with the Portuguese apparently, so I don't see it. I didn't, does that count my trade routes coming to me? Okay, so I think the capital now is going to work on Bolshoi Theater. Nice. Over here. Mashad's looking pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what comes after Nader Shah? His dynasty is called the Afshari dynasty, but there, we read an article recently saying you shouldn't call it that because he wasn't a tribal leader. It was just 
him and his family, the Naderi dynasty, basically. But his family are kind of not very useful, not very great. As it usually goes. <laughs> As it usually goes, yeah. His son takes power, but then is immediately overthrown again. Another one is grandson flees to Afghanistan, has to give over the diamond, as we talked about. And that guy is, he's a tough life. Why? He was blinded, but then they didn't believe he was actually blinded, so they gouged out his eyes. Is that the person they're speaking of in this civilopedia entry? He ordered his own son blinded and then regretted it? That would be another son, but yeah. So there's two sons that were blinded? No, his son was blinded, his grandson was blinded later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But you know, you don't have to wait too long for the next big Persian dynasty to arise, the Zan. Sometimes it's kind of a distinction or a dichotomy made between Nader Shah and the first first Zan leader, Karim Khan Zan. Because Nader is obviously very militarily capable, but just like a ruthless guy. And Karim Khan, you know, less of a great general, but he wasn't bad, obviously. He was very well known for being very generous, very patient, you know, kind of very stable sort of guy, unlike Nader Shah. Karim Khan Zand is, like Nader, born into a nomadic people, born into a Lori tribe mm -hmm. in the Zagros Mountains. Unlike Nader Shah, his father was a tribal leader, so he was important in that tribe. And we had a question from Pazi asking us what great people we would pick, and I think Karim Khan Zand would make a great, great general for the game. I think so. I mean, because he's in the shadow of Nader Shah, he's, sometimes people kind of dismiss his skills, but he was a very, very capable general. Mm -hmm. And he really brought stability to Iran after a period of chaos. Mm -hmm. So what happens with Karim Khan is that Nader invades the Zagros Mountains, Karim Khan resists, but is deported. His whole tribe is deported to Khorasan, and he's conscripted into the army. So again, like Nader Shah, he's a lowly soldier, he's not anyone important, and again, he rises through the ranks. When Nader Shah dies, he's like, we're going home. Him and his whole tribe go back home. Very quickly, you know, they start establishing order again in their region. They capture Esfahan, and in 1751, so just a couple years after Nader Shah dies, they establish the Zan dynasty. Yeah, and this is one of my favorite dynasties. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote a Twitter thread for tweeting historians about it, which I'll link below. Mm -hmm. Their art is so unique, and actually the art of Shiraz mm -hmm. is something that I wrote about. So what city should be named Shiraz? It should be a very pretty city. Yeah, let's find the most appeal. The most appeal goes to Pasargod. Okay, well, that works actually. It's pretty close by. Yeah, actually, good. So Shiraz is known as the City of Roses. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It is both a city where there's many rose gardens, many flowers, and because during the Zand period especially, it gets very well known for rose-colored tiles. Mm -hmm. right? It's a technique that's developed in China, but then moved across Asia into Europe, and the Zand really take hold of that style. And so Shiraz becomes their capital, and they build a kind of very nice mosque. And that would be my pick for the wonder for the Zand. Although the Rajars really renovate it and give mm -hmm. it its like pink, ooh, oh. <laughs> ooh tiles. Um, and that's either Vakil Mosque, which is one pink mosque, mm -hmm. or the more famous and Qajar era mosque, the Nasr al Mulk mosque. Yeah. They're both called the Pink Mosque, so a little confusing. One's a little bit more pink. One's a little bit more pink because of the Orsi windows, which mm -hmm. are windows that are this kaleidoscopic effect. So one thing we notice about the Zand is that they're living in really dangerous times, right? So unlike Safavid Esfahan, which really like is this expansive city, Shiraz is very enclosed, right? They built huge walls. In the middle of the city, they built this huge citadel with giant walls, and they shrink the city by like a third. So they're really trying to put an emphasis on security, on safety, because Iran is such a turbulent place during this time. Even though, like, for example, the citadel at Shiraz is very kind of imposing on the outside, right? Even has a tile depiction of Rostam, the hero from the Shahnameh, fighting a white devil. That's that's what it's called. It's called the white devil. It's called the white <laughs> We're devil. We're not making that up. <laughs> um, on the inside, it's really lush. These gardens, very colorful pavilions. So strong contrast between a formidable exterior and then a very lush, peaceful interior. Yeah. And I think I would include the Citadel of Shiraz as a wonder. I think it's a very interesting building and it's very well preserved actually. And also Zand art is very interesting. You know, as you mentioned, it's really influential on later Qajar art. In terms of a great artist, mm -hmm. uh, there's a very famous Zand artist, Mohammed Sadek. You know, he paints these really interesting paintings of Karim Khan Zand, right? Because unlike the Qajars will be very formal, Karim Khan in his paintings is actually very relaxed. He's like smoking a... <laughs> 
<laughs> and Aguila. They're very naturalistic paintings, but at the same time, they have very deep colors. They have very rich patterns. That artwork is very interesting, and I would put him forward as a great artist for sure. Yeah, and I think one of the most important things about the Zan that's overlooked is just how influential their art is mm -hmm. on the later Iranian period. Yeah, it's only really in the past couple of years that people start to look back at the Zan and actually conduct like, nice academic studies of them. Yes, and we get Plymouth. Thank nice. you very much. Let's keep it and let's rename it. Okay, so this one's a little bit on the edge of our empire and it's related to England, so we're gonna name it Basra. Yeah, and Karim Khan actually takes Basra. That works perfect. Do you wanna talk about what Basra is? Yeah, Basra is the port city of Iraq just past the kind of marshes of the Tigris and Euphrates, but it was founded by the early Muslims and kind of retained as important as a port city. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would have like the British embassy there, the Ottoman embassy there, all their embassies were there. And the city passed back and forth between the Ottomans and the Persians, so yeah. it was a very contested city. Okay, let's see how we're doing on this culture victory. 46 turns. I don't think so. I'm gonna <laughs> speed that up here. So we have all of our trade routes. What's this? Oh, we don't have open borders? Hmm. Gandhi, can you just like chill? <laughs> Why are you so unchill? Why? Wait, is it open borders I don't have or what? Gandhi. So I don't have a trade route with Gandhi, but I'm working on that. And I'm going to get hopefully more luxuries mm -hmm. soon. So let's actually buy the fertile. And can we also rename this city? Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Let's do a snowy Iranian city. Okay. So maybe Tabriz could be good. Okay, yeah. Let's name this one Tabriz. So what is Tabriz? Tabriz is a city in Iranian Azerbaijan. It's a, in the mountains. It was a very, very important city, especially in the 19th century also. It was the first sort of industrial city of Iran as well. Yeah, and our friend is from there. Yeah. Actually, she's from Ardabil, mm -hmm. which is a little bit further off. And that was where this Sheikh Safi's tomb is. Yeah. Just, but it's very close to Tabriz. Yeah, so maybe let's rename this to Ardabil. Is it with an E or A? I think it's A. So one interesting thing is that Karim Khan never actually calls himself Shah. He always refers to himself as Vakil, right? Mm -hmm. So he's a, like a vizier kind of, right? He's not actually the Shah. Now, he puts someone as a Shah, but that person dies immediately, and he just never deals with it again. So <laughs> all of his descendants are vacuoles. And so because of that, he doesn't actually wear the crown, right? He wears a pretty normal turban. But unlike Nader Shah's crown, which is very <laughs> dramatic crown, you which... You can't, can't see it behind the yeah, thing here, but, but you he, know what it is. But he actually designed it himself because he doesn't want to just use the Safavid motifs, Safavid ideology. He really wants to design his own thing. So he creates this, you know, Know, spiky helmet <laughs> which is his crown and if you look at like the Pahlavi crown it actually kind of descends from Nader Shah's crown. So before people would be wearing turbans right mm -hmm. and Nader Shah replaces it with this crownulated Yes, yeah, so it's, it's spiky I guess. I don't, know what you, I don't know what you call it but. And he uses the jewels that he plundered um, on that crown yeah, of his. Yeah. So the Zan dynasty never really fully goes to the extent that Nader Shah's empire did. But there were some kind of elements of competition between the Zan and Nader's legacy. For example, Nader Shah has this peacock throne, which gets lost. The Zan make a marble throne. Not quite as impressive, it. but- No, I love <laughs> you it. Love it? You yeah, love it? Okay, it's really right. cool. And today it's in Golestan <laughs> Palace. Yeah. It was taken there by the Qajars. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if I should use my religion. It's probably about time, right? Yeah, why not? Okay, let's start it. So between Islam and Zoroastrianism, obviously Islam makes more sense for where we're at in the conversation, mm -hmm. but I think this will help us get to this idea of the Persian revival that's mm -hmm. starting out in this time period. Yeah, so towards the late 18th century, early 19th century, you really have Zoroastrian communities in India that start to, you know, really translate the old texts, record the old texts, and uh, Mohammed Tavakoli Targi has a very good book where he's talking about how European Orientalists used to think, oh yeah, we went to India and discovered all this Persian stuff and we made the connection, you know, between Persian and Sanskrit. But actually it was the Persian scholars in India that did that, the Zoroastrian scholars that did that. Yeah, so, you know, they're looking at all these ancient texts and so there's a movement to really kind of revive Achaemenid, revive Sasanian style. Mm -hmm. And that develops actually in India, but then it moves towards Iran. Okay, so in terms of monopolies, let's see what we've got here um the main things left are furs mm -hmm. and the silk mm -hmm. okay. oh actually hagmatana can build a route to india so let's get a trade route in there and 
Yeah. So in 1775, there's a war with the Ottomans. But, you know, the Zand and the Ottomans actually have some pretty interesting relations. You know, a person I work on, the poet Sunduzade Vehbi, is actually sent as an ambassador to the Zand court. And Zand Shiraz remains like a kind of motif in his work, right? It really was like a flourishing, beautiful sort of space. But after Karim Khan Zand dies in 1779, the empire really goes into civil war, constant kind of conflict again. During this time, the Qajars, you might remember them, and Aga Muhammad Khan Qajar, he was actually captured by one of Nader Shah's descendants and castrated, so he was a eunuch. And he was held as a hostage at the court of Karim Khan. Although he was a hostage, he was pretty high up in the hierarchy. But as soon as Karim Khan dies, he rides off to Azerbaijan, begins to lead a rebellion. Pretty soon, by like 1770s, 1780s, like the Qajars in the north are like really pushing against the Zand. And in 1794, the last of the Zand are defeated by the Qajars. Hmm. And in 1796, Aga Muhammad Khan Qajar is crowned in Ardabil, actually, as the new Shah of Iran. So that starts the next dynasty, the Qajar dynasty, which, you know, I think is our favorite dynasty, maybe. It's my favorite dynasty, but, you know, during the 19th century, Iran was seen as having stagnated vis-a-vis -vis Europe. A lot of that blame went to the Qajars, right? right? Okay, it looks like Brussels is now in the game. Ooh. They seem to have popped up over Brussels here. Brussels in the game. Let's get that. There we go. Brussels sprouted up. <laughs> no, <laughs> please. You're too young for dad jokes. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> no, actually not. Okay, and I just got my naturalist. Nice. So here's my plan, and hopefully it's a good one. Hopefully everyone agrees. I'm going to switch over to theology. I don't even have theology. <laughs> I need theology right now. Okay. And then I'll tell you all my plan next turn. <laughs> okay, sounds good. It's a secret plan. <laughs> secret plan. No one knows about this plan. The Zen, the Qajars, historically were seen as like the decline of Iran. And that, again, we want to push back on that. So many interesting things happened during the Qajar period. Okay, here is my plan finally. So I'm going to get a settler out of Korla, or actually out of Ray. You're less important. I'm finally going to settle this city here. And then I'm going to switch into Theocracy because then I get discounts on my naturalists. Mm. And I'm going to put in the amenities card. That was it. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> what? <laughs> I swear there was more to my plan. No, that was not my whole plan. That was a plan. No. Okay. And, <laughs> and I guess we will start off with our naturalists here. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, I, I think I need to rethink my plan. Um, <laughs> I only I had nothing to say. You just had one step. <laughs> step one, switch government. Step two, question mark, question mark. Step, step three, three, win. Yeah. Profit. <laughs> yeah, let me settle the city. I've been meaning to do that. And nice. finally put Victor in Susa. Currently, it says we're going to win in 43 turns. So why don't you leave a comment letting us know when do you think I can finish this game? <laughs> Place your bets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed our Nader Shah episode. And next episode, we're going to get into the Kajars. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. See you. Bye. Bye.